suit can be brought uh, against uh, Israel, whether those the plaintiffs have a legal standing. And that should be, the result of that should be imminent, what the court is going to rule. And, and that brings me to the third question, uh, which is the question was put, well, isn't international law just a game of the great powers? And actually, didn't they create the international law? And so on and so forth. I'm no great defender of the international law. I think it has very severe limitations. I think on some aspects of the international law, one day the world, if it survives, will look back with kind of bemusement notions like laws of war. You know, laws of war is like etiquette for cannibals. It just doesn't really make sense. Law is about how civilized people resolve things. And how can you have laws of war? It doesn't really make sense. But on the other hand, we should be a little bit careful and a little bit cautious about too quickly dismissing the kinds of, I'll use the word again with qualification, the kinds of progress that have been registered in international law. Now, for those of you who are skeptics, let me just give you two examples relevant to this conflict. As the young man who asked the question said, there is a movement now afoot among Israel's supporters. They call it the struggle against lawfare, L-A-W-F-A-R-E. And lawfare is for them a version of what they call warfare. And they say that Israel's critics are using the law against Israel. So they call it lawfare. If the law were just about the great powers and the powerful, then Israel and its supporters would not be trying so hard to undo that law. They find the law is an obstacle to their goals. That's why they're trying to reverse the law, or what they call lawfare. Let's take the second example. Be skeptical as you want, and I'll agree with you about international law. But you have to bear in mind that on all the crucial issues bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict, the law has come out squarely on the Palestinian side. Settlements, International Court of Justice said, illegal under international law. The West Bank in Gaza, International Court of Justice says, the whole of it belongs to the Palestinians. East Jerusalem, the International Court of Justice says, it's occupied Palestinian territory. The right of the refugees to return to their homes and or receive compensation. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, they've said, that is a Palestinian right to return. So on all the crucial issues of the conflict, the law has been resoundingly on the side of the Palestinians. And so I think we should be a little bit careful and cautious before we repudiate the law, because that's exactly what Israel wants. They would like to say, yes, the law is biased, the law is partial, so let's put the law aside and let's just sit down and talk. They don't want the law because they know exactly where the law stands, and it stands against them. Um, the campaign and the task of the reclamation of Jewish assets in Swiss banks is something that you alluded to um, in your collaborations in the past. Could you perhaps? Uh, further sort of enlighten us as well as to shed light on if this process has been saturated with elements of hypocrisy and ambiguity on the part of the Israeli government thinking. Thank you. Please go ahead. Um, hi, uh, Dr. Pinkerson. Um, I have a question. You might have heard in different reports that Israel might be considering to launch preemptive airstrike or preemptive military actions against it, uh, Iran. I want to ask your opinion, how likely do you think this is? So not nuclear war, as a previous person said, but airstrikes, maybe a, a lower kind of military attacks, which might in a way be just as bad. Thank you. Thank you. One more, please. Uh, 
as an organizer of the Jewish opposition, uh, I would refer to the recent uh, initiatives to uh, change the definition of what it is to be a person of Jewish origin by uh, obliging people to declare their loyalty to the Zionist nation state of Israel. Uh, I would uh, like to start to congratulate you on being able to destroy this myth of uh, the redefinition of, uh, of Jewish people as a Zionist. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, say that uh, I appreciate uh, your efforts on a personal level as well. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And what a good yeah. <laughs> Let me just do the three questions. Uh, the first question, I don't think most people in the audience will really be familiar with the details. Uh, I wrote a book about 10 years ago now, a decade now, on Israel's exploitation and misuse of the Nazi Holocaust. And one of the issues that I discussed, which I suspect younger people in this room will not even have any memory of, was the Israeli uh, Jewish organizations uh, shaking down European governments in the name of what they called needy Holocaust victims. And one of the governments they targeted was Switzerland in particular, the Swiss banks. Uh, there's no possibility now to go into the details. The only thing I can say which kind of amuses me is that virtually everybody who was involved in the shakedown of the Swiss banks and the Jewish organizations, they ended up either in jail or discredited or lost their jobs because they were a gang of crooks or Holocaust hucksters, as I called them at the time. Actually, the only one whose reputation survived intact from that sordid era was my own. Uh, the the uh, second question is, was the likelihood of an attack on Iran? I put the likelihood of an attack on Iran as quite low because it's clear that Israel cannot attack Iran on its own, that for various logistical reasons, it simply doesn't have the technical capacity to launch the kind of attack it would need to uh, 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 disable uh, Iranian uh, nuclear sites. And I don't think the United States would give a green light at this point for an attack on Iran. Things may change, of course, if a Republican administration comes into power. But for the moment, I don't think the, uh, Mr. Obama, burdened as he is with many other problems, would want the potential fallout of the attack on Iran to deal with. What was the third question? There was a question about the Swiss banks. That was the, the first, and then the Iran, and what was the third? That was the Oh, about the, 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 the uh, yeah. The only thing I would say with regard to the comment you know, I'm trying as hard as I can, I think we should all try as hard as we can, uh, to try to reach out to people. And one of the ways of reaching out, I think, is to try to appeal to people in their basic principles, sense of right and wrong. And we shouldn't have any kind of ideological litmus tests. Are you now or have you ever been a communist? Are you now or have you ever been a Zionist? I don't care if you're a Zionist, I don't care if you're a communist, I really don't care what you are. I just want to know where you stand the basic issues of human rights in this conflict. Now Richard Goldstone, if you ask Richard Goldstone, he's very emphatic and he's very clear and he's very forthright. He says, I'm a Zionist. And you'll never dissuade him from those, that personal commitment. His mother was an activist in the Zionist movement. His daughter was an activist, lived in Israel. He was in the board of directors of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And yet Israel says, and Mr. Netanyahu, we gave a speech about a year ago, and he says, we face three main enemies in the world today, three main problems. Number one, he said, Iran. Number two, he said, Goldstone. And number three, he said, missiles, you know, the missiles from Hezbollah and Hamas and everything. Now, if you can see Goldstone as part, or potentially part of our movement, then our movement will never grow. If you demand these kinds of ideological litmus tests, like Mr. Goldstone, you can't be part of us unless you publicly renounce Zionism. It's hopeless. It's pointless. We should just give up find a little room and form a cult, you know, <laughs> elect a guru, you know, and then chant Om for the next couple of years. But I don't think 
that's what we want. We want to reach people on basic human principles, which, and we shouldn't lose sight of the goal. And the goal is to enable the people of Palestine to live dignified human, human lives. And we shouldn't forget that. And we're not fighting an ideological battle where each of us is trying to aggrandize his or her ego. We're trying to end the suffering or at least lighten the burdens of people who have suffered much too long. Thank you. I'll help you with the questions. I'll help you. Okay. So please, we're going to take all four here. So please, just start your question with what, where, why, <laughs> and be as quick and as deep as you can. Please, thanks. I'll start with thank you. Uh, I, uh, my question is, uh, a large portion of Israel actually, very close to what we were just talking about, a large portion of Israel and Israelis believe that they stand on the moral high ground. And my question is, where does that moral vacuum come from? And will Israel ever change from the inside? Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hello. My question is, does uh, the politics of Iran play an important role in peacemaking of uh, Palestinian people, or does it serve a different agenda? Iran, you ask? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You said at one point in the lecture that uh, Israel lost the war in 2006, uh, and that Israel would not accept another military defeat. However, I would say that Hezbollah won the political war, but certainly not the military war. Well, what would, in your opinion, change in imminent words from? Thank you. I didn't hear the very last thing. What, in your opinion? Uh, what would, in your opinion, change in the imminent words to come? <laughs> Please go ahead. Hi. Um, I just want to know, what do you say to people who uh, feel helpless knowing that the leaders of the world, including Arab leaders, choose to do nothing but the conflict? <laughs> Thank you. And we'll give you a chance to answer, so please go ahead. I'm taking notes, I'm taking notes, look. Please go ahead. Yes. I think people are beginning to suspect Grace's motives. <laughs> well, I want to respect everyone's time. I know, I appreciate you being here. Please. Okay, so uh, latest reports are accusing Hezbollah of uh, assassinating Rafiq Hariri in Lebanon. Do you think that this is a part of a plan to cause a civil war in Lebanon in order to facilitate the uh, upcoming Israeli invasion that you were talking about? Thank you. Thank you. And so we're going to take one more, but you, Dr. Fajal Seed is amazing. He will stick around. Uh, if you get books, you'd like him. They are already autographed. If you'd like him to write a note, if you have a question you haven't had a chance to ask him, he will stick around and you can ask him. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bittlesang. My question is, um, as you mentioned, the peace process is more of a facade and a fiction than any real commitment to peace. And my question is, how important do you think, uh, like I've noticed that reparations have been absent in the discussion for peace and peace negotiations. How important do you think uh, talking about uh, sizable reparations to Palestinians and the land that appropriated would lead to uh, accomplishing peace in the Middle East? Excuse me, Dr. Finkelstein. Can I ask you? I just got, we were told security they need to close very shortly. Do you close the, uh, the doors? So, would you mind? Can I ask you to be brief? I don't know. Okay. I have to answer and remind you of yes. the question. So, the moral high ground. Okay. What makes them think they have the moral high ground? Well, I think that was probably a better question put to Gideon Levy and myself. The fact of the matter is, if you look at the polls from the Lebanon, the Israeli attack on, on uh, the West Bank, Operation Defensive Shield in 2002, the Israeli attack on Lebanon in 2006, the Israeli attack on the Mahdi Mamre, the polls show in all the cases 90% or more of the Israelis supported those attacks. And the fact of the matter is, Israelis are now kind of like South Africans in the 1960s, they have it in their minds that the whole world is against them, and that no matter what they do, and however good they are, and however beautiful they are, the world is still going to condemn them. So they're kind of hunkering down in their bunkers, and it's very tough now to change their minds. But I think what we have to do is accepting the fact 